Welcome back to Student to Stud. We're going to do a quick and dirty video on the distal radius. So, x-ray measurements, going over the AP, oblique, and lateral views. We're going to primarily focus on the AP and lateral because this is what we're going to use to make our radiographic measurements. First is 23 degrees of radial inclination. Next is going to be 12 millimeters of radial height and 11 degrees of volar tilt. These are all the normal parameters that you need to remember, and the easiest way to remember this, just remember the math equation, 11 plus 12 equals 23. So why do we need to know those? Well, if we have less than 5 millimeters of shortening of the radial height, less than 5 degrees of change in radial inclination, less than 2 millimeters of step-off, or less than 5 degrees of dorsal angulation, or if we're looking at the contralateral distal radius, if it's within 20 degrees, then we could say these are indications for non-operative management. So knowing the acceptable criteria and the normals are very important and very high yield. Remember, 11 plus 12 equals 23, and all the acceptable criteria start with a 2 or a 5. So classifications, always high yield. In this instance, none of these help with actual treatment dictation, but Freichmann is often asked about. Just remember type 1 is extraarticular and the rest are intraarticular. Type 3 is going to be radiocarpal and type 5 radial ulnar and type 7 is going to be both. And all the even numbers just include an ulnar styloid. So the modified Lalfontaine's criteria. If you have more, 3 or greater than any of these, then it's going to predict with some certainty that the fracture that we reduced and tried to treat non-operatively will go to fall out of alignment and we're going to have to take it to the operating room. So just remember, do Adidas. If you have a fracture with initial displacement greater than a centimeter, if you have a patient with severe osteoporosis, if they're older than 60, their dorsal comminution is greater than 50%, if it's an intraarticular fracture, dorsal angulation greater than 20 degrees, if they have an associated ulnar fracture, or if their initial radial shortening was greater than 5 millimeters, we can say with some certainty that they are not going to do well with non-operative therapy, and we should take them right away for operative treatment. So, eponyms, blast through these guys. Radial styloid fragment, what's this called? Chauffeur. We have a dorsal angulated distal radius, what's this called? Collies. What about if it's volarly angulated? That's a Smith. And if it's a dislocated radiocarpal joint, that's a Barton. This is a volar Barton because it's volarly displaced. So some treatment options. Non-operative, if we're within those acceptable criteria, then we can say with some certainty that we will have a great success treating them with closed reduction and casting. Now, operative. Remember, if we're outside of those tolerances, got to take it to surgery. Any fracture with an eponym uh, most likely is going to be taken to surgery. If they are having associated ulnar fracture, not including an ulnar styloid. If they have severe osteoporosis or if they failed non-operative treatment. So some options are volar dorsal plating, pinning, or an X-fix. Surgical approaches we'll go over in detail later, but really get down the volar henry, down pat, know your nerves, where the radial artery is, and the surgical approach. Lastly, we'll go over some potential complications. So acute carpal tunnel syndrome can theoretically occur with any distal radius fracture, so you need to look out for any numbness or tingling in the median nerve distribution that does not go away after the first 24 to 48 hours after your closed reduction and splinting or casting. EPL ruptures, these most commonly associated with non-displaced distal radius fractures. These are secondary to either weakening of the tendon, callus formation, or a local area of ischemia in the tendon. You treat these with an EIP to EPL transfer. Lastly is FPL rupture. These are caused from physical contact between the tendon and plate due to displacement of the volar plate distal to the watershed line. I know that was a lot, but keep on studying and I hope this helped.